As tension rises again over the IRA hunger strikes in Northern Ireland, the Catholic Church faces mounting criticism that it's encouraging violence and lending support to the IRA. I couldn't live with my own conscience if I were in any way to go out of my way to find some excuse for the murderous campaign of the IRA. Unfortunately and very, very sadly, I think there have been some priests who have tried to find excuses for murder. The Catholic Church in Northern Ireland now faces its worst crisis in the last 10 years. The effect of the IRA hunger strikes in the Catholic community has been to force more and more Catholics into a fervently anti-British mood, and with this mood has come increasing support for the IRA. While the Church has continually tried to distance itself from the violent means that the IRA has adopted in order to achieve a united Ireland, the Church's close identification for hundreds of years with the overall aims of Irish nationalism makes its position a very uneasy one. Tim Pat Coogan is editor of the Irish Press and an authority on the IRA's history. It's part of the history of Ireland, part of the conquest. Uh, when the land has been taken from the people, the religion was also taken from them. The penal laws were instituted whereby priests were hunted uh, and executed. You had the same thing in England. It was only in 1829 that the church came above ground with Catholic emancipation, Maynooth was founded, and you had a native Irish clergy for the native Irish people. And uh, whenever any nationalist form of assertion took place, the bulk of its members would be, of course, A, Irish, and B, by definition, Catholic. So any nationalist manifestation will involve people who have two characteristics. They are Irish and Catholic. Just how far the Church's historical identification with Republican ideals now goes has been put sharply to the test since the IRA hunger strike campaign began. And the stand of many clergy has come in for strong criticism. The Church figure who's been most criticised, especially in the British press, is Cardinal Thomas Sophie, Primate of All Ireland. The Cardinal made his general position on nationalism clear in a credo interview two years ago. I have never hid the fact that I uh, am a nationalist in the sense that I, I, I believe in an Irish nation. Uh, I have also, of course, made it very clear that that is simply a personal viewpoint. While the Cardinal has condemned IRA violence and appealed to the hunger strikers to end their fast, he's also pressed the Prime Minister to abandon her inflexible stand. This, and his apparent sympathy for the hunger strikers themselves, has prompted criticism not only in the British press, but also from politicians like Jerry Fitt, Northern Ireland's only Catholic MP. But I think that the IRA, having listened to the Cardinal, would think that he was just a little bit on their side in their aims. He has referred to them as boys and girls. He has said that they wouldn't have been in prison had it not been for the political history of Northern Ireland. He has sent a telegram to Margaret Thatcher, threatening her with the wrath of the nationalist people in Ireland. Now, all these are highly political speeches, uh, sentiments expressed. They are not uh, purely uh, religious. And I think that the IRA, they are absolutely no fools. They see someone who is a nationalist, as they are, and they will exploit every word which he utters, which appears to be in support of them. Strong nationalist sympathies are felt not merely by the Cardinal, but by many priests as well. Father Dennis Fall is a noted opponent of the British presence in Northern Ireland. We are just the same as Poland. Our Catholicism and our nationalism are knit together by centuries of oppression. Just the same as the Poles had to survive by their religion. So the Irishman for centuries, his nationalist, nationalistic expressions found their outlet through his religion because the British persecuted both his nationalism and his religion for three or four centuries. This blending of nationalism with Catholicism goes further in the church than just well-known activists like Father Fall. The death of hunger striker Raymond McCreesh, whose brother is a priest, seems to have prompted many churchmen to display their nationalist sympathies, according to critics like Jerry Fitt. There were 60 Catholic priests attended his funeral. 
Now, one has only got to ask oneself what would be the feeling of the Catholics if there was a, a Protestant paramilitary funeral and 60 Protestant ministers went to that funeral. So I think that the Protestant population in Ireland now, they are seeing a closer identity than they have ever done before between the Catholic Church and nationalism. A nightly prayer is said for the IRA hunger strikers in one of Belfast Catholic ghettos. The sympathy of many ordinary priests for the protesters is perhaps not surprising given that, like them, they're drawn from a community which still feels discriminated against on grounds of religion. Nine years of direct rule from Westminster have brought little improvement for Catholics in terms of housing and employment. As the recession bites deep into the province, two-thirds of all unemployment in Northern Ireland is still among Catholics who form only one-third of the population. Frustration over poor conditions and resentment of British rule are fused in the minds of many Catholics. Father Fall's opposition to the British presence and his highlighting of complaints about the security forces have made him a thorn in the side of the authorities. His work with the Association of Legal Justice takes him round Catholic areas collecting evidence about the army's use of plastic bullets, as here in the Divis Flats in Belfast. Where were you standing? When I was you standing hit? here. Yes. I was looking up there. There was there must have been twenty of them at yeah. least, mm. and they came down. And the women was rattling their legs, you know, on this thing here. Yeah. And they came down. One of them says to me, "Get you half men." Mm. And before I could do anything, he just from about there he let go into my waist, you know. Is he able to eat anything? No, he can't eat at all. He's getting fed through tubes up his nose. But where was he hit exactly? You think? He what? was hit in the brain. Hit, hit that's at the a, back hit, of the head. With the right hand side right of the. Right hand side. Hit somewhere like that. The right hand side of the head. Yeah. With a plastic bullet. With a plastic bullet, and he's paralysed down the left side. Father Fall is also a regular visitor to the H blocks at the Mays Prison, or Long Kesh as it used to be called, where eight men are now on hunger strike. Father Fall doesn't see the hunger strikes as morally wrong in themselves even though he disapproves of the tension they cause in the community. While some would claim the protesters' action amounts to suicide, which the church condemns, Father Fall and other priests like him maintain it's a justifiable form of protest which puts the onus of blame onto the British government. The, the hunger strikers in Long Cash obviously do not wish to die, they do not intend to die. It's the hunger with the threat of death, which is the protest. After all, they do take water and salt, and Bobby Sands did say to his mother that he would stretch out his arm for the injection to revive him if uh, he got his five demands. So therefore, they, they have no intention of dying. Their, their primary intention is to is not suicide. Their primary intention is to make a substantial protest which will bring worldwide attention to focus on their demand to be treated with uh, dignity and human rights. I said to Bobby Sands, for example, just to test him out, I said, why don't you do a hunger and thirst strike? Get it over quickly in about 12 days use your death as an instrument. I, wa I mean, I, I wasn't trying to make him do it, I was trying to dissuade him from doing it. But I was testing him out to see what his idea was. No, he said, that's not what we want. We want the long period of pressure on the British government to give them time to focus their attention on our grievances and see that they are reasonable demands and hope that we can get what we have been demanding for four or five years. But critics of this kind of argument, which excuses hunger striking to death as a threat gone wrong, see it as a way of trying to justify the immoral. Father Anthony Mulvey is parish priest in the Catholic border town of Straban. It's morally wrong for any reason. If we're talking again about a hunger strike to the death, which I'm afraid in the present circumstances we have to accept is the case. Um, we've just had four deaths already that should not have occurred. And uh, again, I suppose we have to speak with respect for the feelings of the families involved. If those men should be alive and the families should not be bereaved. And there's no reason that can justify a deliberately intended uh, fast to the death. Even if it's conditionally intended, in other words, unless I get the concessions, I will fast to the death. That, I'm afraid, is an intention to uh, starve oneself to the bitter end. <laughs> While Father Mulvey takes a firm line against the IRA's current hunger striking tactics, he's nevertheless well acquainted with the background of Catholic grievances. 
As a priest in London Derry, he took a strong stand against the British Army on the day known as Bloody Sunday in 1972, when 13 Catholics were shot dead. He took part in a press conference the following day to protest against the Army's action. We accuse the Colonel of the Parachute Regiment of willful murder. We accuse the Commander of Land Forces of being an accessory before the fact. We accuse the soldiers of shooting indiscriminately into a fleeing crowd. Of hatred and bigotry. Though today Father Mulvey's Irish nationalist sympathies and his involvement with his community remain strong, he now believes that political considerations should not influence his interpretation of the Church's teaching about the immorality of violence. I probably have a kind of a, a nationalistic background myself, but I think, you know, the, the faith is a universal faith. Uh, the commandments are universal, the standards that we have to pursue are universal, and I would hope that uh, every priest puts that first and that the law of God has to be stated, sometimes in a forthright way that may not uh, be, at that moment, acceptable to everyone else. The desire to be acceptable in the community raises problems for a local priest most pointedly when he's asked to perform a funeral for a dead IRA member. The IRA always try to use such occasions as an opportunity for propaganda, but the Irish bishops have recommended priests to ensure their worship is not exploited by paramilitary organisations. I think that these funerals have been used by the provisional IRA as a propaganda exercise. It's a propaganda exercise for an organisation that has rejected the Catholic Church and everything that the Pope has said. And the methods that they use are immoral. Therefore, in my view, it's an immoral organisation. And to have it uh, related to a Catholic requiem service in any way, where the actions of people are glorified, uh, um, actions that are directly contrary to what the Church teaches, well, I think it's, uh, the two things just don't go together. And I have said that uh, in the unfortunate event, which we hope doesn't happen, that we will be glad to give the same Catholic requiem as we would in other circumstances, because a requiem mass is a prayer for the mercy of God, and that I would not go along with any mingling of the paramilitary procedures with uh, a Catholic uh, requiem mass. The trouble is that paramilitary ceremonies can still take place outside the church, where some priests maintain it's not up to them to exercise control. We are not policemen, and Britain wants to make us her policemen, and we will not be Britain's policemen, and we will not be the British Army. And what takes place on the streets of Belfast is the matter for the law of the land, and we are not going to go out and do policemen and do British soldiers for the British. Inside the Catholic Church, no paraphernalia of paramilitary type are allowed. The coffin comes in the door of the church like any other Irishman and he's put in front of the altar, and the priest says a mass, which is not a thanksgiving service like you have in Westminster Abbey for all your great men, where they blow themselves up, you know, let's say, we give thanks for the great life. That's not a Catholic service. We don't give thanks for his great life. We ask God to forgive his sins, to have mercy on his soul, and to give him eternal rest, and to console his relatives who are grieving sorely for him. The parish priest in the Bogside area of Derry faced the reality of deciding whether to give a funeral to Patsy O'Hara, a hunger striker from the ranks of the Irish National Liberation Army, the Republican paramilitary group to the left of the provisional IRA. Father Michael Collins has frequently condemned Republican paramilitary violence. However, even though Patsy O'Hara's family and his organization wanted a full Republican funeral, as a priest, he still felt he had to give the service on the grounds he was making a pastoral decision, not a political one. I tried to approach it as not so much the death of a hunger striker or the funeral of a hunger striker, but rather the death of a parishioner. And to see it as, the, as death being the important thing rather than the circumstances of death. To, and trying to see, what was the, what kind of help could I offer to the people who were most hurt or most affected by this death? 
Father Collins did make it clear that paramilitary trappings should not be brought into the church. But though he himself feels he had good reason for conducting the funeral as he did, he appreciates that the church could appear to be condoning violence. Undoubtedly, there will be some people who see the church as being somehow supportive of violence. If you see a picture of a funeral, uh, an IRA funeral, with the priest walking at the head of the procession and a line of masked men walking alongside the coffin, then I think inevitably, in many people's mind, there will be an association created between the two. Those who criticise the church for its ambivalent practice would only really be satisfied if the church disassociated itself entirely from violence by refusing funerals altogether. To Father Fall, though, and others like him, this would be out of the question. I don't think it could be justified theologically, it certainly couldn't be justified pastorally, and I don't think, I don't think it would have, knowing the Irish as I do, I don't think it would have any effect on them. It put them into a very bad temper, and it would alienate probably hundreds and hundreds of families in that particular parish. Certainly Father Collins's parishioners in the Bogside would have been deeply offended if he'd refused to bury Patsy O'Hara. It's his Christian duty to bury Patsy O'Hara, that's my opinion. If the church here had refused your funeral, what would you have felt? I think it would have turned me. Really turned me. Would you have felt that you would stop going to church? No, I don't think I would have, would have stopped going to church, but I would have had a bit more different ideas about it. The church can't judge, you know. They can't judge Patio O'Hara, like, you know, that's up to God, like, and we can't say that he was a terrorist, you know. Uh, every Catholic's entitled to a Christian burial. And grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. The, the difficulty the then for the church is that if it appears too sympathetic to Irish nationalism in the current setting, it offends those who feel that it's compromising the universal Catholic teaching against violence. If it does apply that teaching rigidly, it loses support among those who are frustrated at the current political deadlock in Northern Ireland. And this tension gets deeper each week as one more prisoner joins the protest raising the emotional temperature and creating a climate for more violence. It's to this wave of emotion that many attribute the election as MP of the IRA hunger striker Bobby Sands and Jerry Fitt's defeat in the local elections. Absolutely no doubt about it that I lost my seat because under no circumstances will I give any support whatsoever to people who are committing murder to people who are taking away lives and to people in a very brutal way are even taking away limbs, blowing the arms and legs off people in support of their political objectives. I have made my position quite clear. There has been a great deal of hysteria. The parades and marches that have taken place, the election of Bobby Sands to the Fermanagh South Tyrone constituency, the tremendous publicity and the involvement of a number of priests who have very clearly identified themselves with the aims of the IRA, not with their methods. This has all had a tremendous impact on the Catholic population, and it was quite understandable that I could never have won an election in those circumstances. To avoid the impression that the Church is being pulled into support for the IRA and so compromising its moral principles, some priests feel they must now risk greater unpopularity among Republican sympathisers. Uh, I think some of us have to face the fact that we are saying unpopular things and we may lose for a time uh, the support of people we, don't, we would prepare, prefer to have with us. I think people are worried a bit by the apparent alienation of young people especially uh, when uh, a blunt truth about the nature of suicide is expressed. Well, you know, just speaking from the experience of 30 years the apparently alienated will return and will have respect for the church if it's on a matter of principle and the integrity of the church is what will bring them back again to it. And that's why I don't think there should ever be any defaulting and uh, I wish the people again and again would go back to what the Pope said and they could see uh, a priest's principal task in the present context as presenting the Pope's words as forcefully as possible so that people will think as Catholics rather maybe than as, uh, for the moment, at any rate, emotionally disturbed nationalists. What Father Mulvey wants is for priests to remind people more clearly 
of the Pope's condemnation when he came to Ireland of all violence, whether it's politically motivated or not. But it's also true that the Pope had another message for politicians. He said it was their duty to find political solutions which removed the grievances from which violence springs. These grievances, say many priests, are certainly not the responsibility of the church. And until they're removed by some political advance, the church's power to prevent violence must remain limited. If you put youngsters into a situation they have in parts of Belfast and Derry, where they are the third and fourth generation of unemployment, where they saw the fathers and mothers dragged off to internment and tortured, where they've been beaten about by the British Army, where they've hardly any prospects in life. That's imposed upon the political. That may give them the desire to at least go out with a martyr's funeral, but certainly not the Catholic Church gives it to them. It's given to them by the whole situation by which they are surrounded, which is a political situation brought about by very bad government by the British. And whatever their other differences, both Father Fall and Father Mulvey agree that if the church is to be asked to change its attitude, so too should the politicians. To many Catholics, the government's approach to the current crisis appears unnecessarily inflexible. They all wish the hunger strike was over. They all have sympathy for the suffering, the lingering death involved, for the person involved. But they, uh, they can see that responsibility rests with the people who have... Uh, instigated this and um, certainly they wish also that there would be movement from the government and that there wouldn't be this apparent callous indifference to death. I'm not saying it is callous indifference but it, it can easily appear that way and uh, they wish that there was some movement there. With repeated confrontations on the streets of Northern Ireland, priests' messages against violence have little effect while the province is gripped by its political deadlock. The church has, however, recently taken an important lead in condemning the hunger strikes as evil and lending its weight to a suggested compromise solution. But although this may have reassured some more moderate Catholics, the hunger strikers themselves and their supporters have rejected it. The government's new promise of an advisory council won't contain the mounting anger of many Catholics with another hunger strike death approaching. It seems there's little more the church can do now until some political changes are achieved. I think it's a political situation. I think the church could help if there was a political uh, solution proposed. But the church really can do absolutely nothing in a military situation, which is what it is. It's a war zone. And the, the role of any church figure in any war zone is much the same. About the best hope he has is to act as a chaplain. But he's not going to stop the two armies fighting. <laughs>